So we're moving towards the latter part of the winter harvest season. I thought I'd uh, do a quick tour of the greenhouse to uh, show where things stand. It's been very illuminating uh, this uh, particular winter. Um, taking a look around you can see we have these large trees around the garden. It's been the shadiest location by far I've ever endeavoured to grow uh, foods into winters in, and uh, the results have been telling. I suspect the um, harvest has amounted to probably about 15 to 20 percent of what we would usually uh, harvest from uh, a garden. Uh, a winter garden this year. The primary challenges, lack of sunlight uh, resulting in lack of vigour, resulting in lack of growth, and then very heavy disease pressure as a result of the uh, relatively high degrees of shade and moisture I suspect. And uh, the greenhouse are no different. Typically uh, greenhouses this size are absolute engines of productivity into winter. I'd be harvesting um, intensively off a greenhouse like this. Winter, we say, is the prime salad season of the year, and these winter greenhouses can be extraordinarily productive. One of the prime uh, reasons for that is we've zeroed in on crop types and then cultivars within those crop types that have particular characteristics, namely disease resistance and vigour. The brassica wrappers, mizunas, and choys, and tatsoys, and so on and so forth, all the mustards, the Asian mustards, and, and to a degree the Indian mustards, have a very interesting characteristic, which is that if you plant them in the spring or the summer, they grow, they come up fast, and they bolt, they go to flower. But when you grow them into winters, that vigour is essentially maintained. The plants don't bolt but that speed and that vigour remains. So we have these plants that produce and continue to produce extraordinary amounts of food thrust through winter. And at the same time, they also have this extraordinary disease resilience, which means that we can pack them in really tight like this. This is a mizuna here and into the reds. And then this is the mispuna, which is a variation on uh, mizuna, uh, bred by Frank Morton at Wild Garden Seeds, for example. And you can see it planted in a thicket and um, allows one to harvest, plant densely, harvest off of them repeatedly. Um, that's one of the remarkable characteristics of the Asians and why we rely so heavily on them. On this side, we have, uh, this is a red vein sorrel, this is a perennial, so it's not going anywhere. For most of the winter it's looked absolutely dreadful, <laughs> really diseasy. But now it's really beginning to colour up and look bright and wonderful. Um, in a typical winter greenhouse these things would be the size of almost bushes right now. Um, they got nailed by uh, underground predation um, in their establishment. And then the lack of sunshine and everything means that they're looking um, that uh, I haven't really harvested off them much at all this winter. They'll put on a whole bunch of growth now, I think, and we'll start to get some. Uh, you can see just the life and the colour and those leaves. It's just gorgeous. Um, and then we've got celery. Uh, we'll start harvesting that just now. And then chard. Um, the chards outside went down. It's one of the reasons I always put a sun chards inside the winter greenhouse. This tiny little uh, cluster of chards here are going to boom over the course of the next few weeks and be a lovely source of food. And beyond that, um, sorrel, and then into the, sp again, another perennial, and then into the spinaches. Spinach is uh, one of the most productive of the late season greens. I generally don't touch it until the spring. Um, uh, but, and then we've got <laughs> the uh, storage onions and a flat of echinacea that's just about to pop and peas and so forth. But the story, I think, gets a little more telling up here to cilantro um, as we move more fully into uh, the thicket of Asians. 
Uh, I was mentioning that disease has really been an issue uh, for, for, for us. The plants are looking relatively healthy at this point. They've had a little bit of sunshine in recent weeks. But for the most part, a lot of my Asians this winter have looked like that. Or like this. Or even on the Juncia, typically a really robust crop, like that. Very um, damaged and damaging where typically there wouldn't be a speck of disease on the Asians. Um, that said, um, the relative disease-freeness of the plants just now is a notable quality as the plants move into a whole new stage of growth. What we're seeing right now, for example, is many of these plants going into flower. Can you see that? Now, um, it's generally not talked about or in the literature, but the um, these little florets, or rab, as they're referred to, are spectacular. They're perfumed. They have this incredibly um, delicate touch to them, a lovely flavour a scent, a perfume almost. And so there's a whole array of another wave of harvest reflecting that gorgeous life force, really, that comes in even as these plants begin um, to go to flower. It's lovely the way these plants can feed one in so many different ways. Typically, we'll feed off these Asians and still, until they start to turn bitter. You'll get individual plants in a population that will go first, and then an entire population will turn, and uh, different cultivars will um, turn at different rates. One of the things that's significant about this winter cropping system really is, as distinct from the um, field crops, which are mostly Europeans, we have this heavy focus on Asians. And one of the reasons I feel it's important to stress that is not simply in terms of the agricultural dimension, but also what you might call the um, archetypal dimension. Winter cropping systems in the Pacific Northwest that work well are these fusions of Asian and European cultures. It's reflected not simply in terms of the fact that we bring, for example, this is a choy from Frank Morton in Philomath, so we've got that gorgeous countercultural, psychedelic almost element that's introduced into the classic green and white Asian choy, but also in terms of um, a, fundal, a fundamental mix of genes. I mean, look at this population here. This is Gulag Stars that was developed by um, Tim Peters, a legendary independent Oregonian plant breeder. And it's actually what we call an interspecific cross of Asian greens and Russo-Siberian kales. He made it using traditional um, hand bud pollination um, to sort of uh, circumvent um, pollen incompatibility mechanisms in crops that, that, that gives that sort of gives the impression I know more about what I'm talking about than I do. What I do know is that the fruits of this traditional plant breeding approach has produced a population and a crop type indeed that's absolutely extraordinary. I mean look at the disease resistance on this. I mean it's completely clean. It's absolutely fantastic. And this almost represents a classic embodiment of a marriage of Asian and European cultures in a food crop that absolutely excels in the Pacific Northwest. These cultural complementarities are what the world is absolutely full of and really show that the way ahead, I think, for us all is to just put down this facile, anachronistic notion of nation states and the infantile pathologies that sustain them 
as we move into a planetary embrace that reflects this dizzying array of synergies and symbioses and complementarities that basically allow us to move ahead in ways that are coherent and that work and that are exquisitely beautiful. This is, this is what China and the West is really fundamentally about. Not the ministrations of merchants of death. <laughs>